Hello, so I thought I would do some off-the-cuff commentary on the excerpt from Herodotus's The Histories on the Battle of Marathon, because it's such a wonderful thing to talk about. So to give a quick overview for anyone who has not listened to the video that is linked on the screen, the Persians are invading Greece to avenge themselves for the burning of Sardis, because the Athenians had a direct hand in that. The Persian expedition is a punitive one, to punish the Athenians for messing with Persian affairs, as one might expect. So who are the Persians, especially in the eyes of the Athenians? Well, the Persians are an Iranic tribe from the southern, southwestern Iran, who eventually overtook the Empire of the Medes, which spanned from Persia to the Mediterranean Sea, which was built on the remains of the old Assyrian Empire. The Persians, after taking this, then conquered the Babylonian Empire, and then effectively conquered everything in the west of Asia. They took the Lydian Empire from the Lydians, and they took the Egyptian Kingdom from the Egyptians, to the point where now, almost everything east of Greece, in the Greek mind, is just simply a part of the Persian Empire. To the Greeks, as far as they are aware of the land stretching, everything is Persian. So. To them, it is a world empire. It is a superpower. It is colossal. Compared to Athens, with a population of around perhaps 250,000 at its peak, and Attica, the Persian Empire probably had between somewhere between 15 to 50 million. Obviously, estimates wildly vary, but we're talking about huge amounts of people compared to the Athenians. In fact, compared to Greece in itself, I've seen estimates of Greece being between two and four million people, something like that, or probably not even that. Whereas Italy, this was one of the main arguments why the Romans managed to conquer Greece, is because Italy had about double the population. What I'm saying is that Greece in totality was quite a small place, and Athens even smaller. And Persia was colossal, absolutely enormous. The power and majesty of the Persians went before them wherever they went, because never before in human history had any one group of people been so powerful as the Persians. And now a large and powerful Persian army was being guided by a Greek called Hippias to conquer Athens. Modern estimates of the Persian army put it between about 25 and 30,000 men. And for a Greek army, that would be enormous. Most large city-states could field around 10,000 hoplites. This was roughly the number of Spartiates, or homoi, similars, from Sparta, the professional soldiers, and it was about the number of armed hoplites that Athens put into the field, along with the Plataeans, at Marathon. A Greek army would, of course, also included a small amount of light cavalry and numbers of slingers and peltasts as light infantry for support, but the main body of the fighting was done by hoplite infantry. And so the world-famous and eminently feared Persian Empire, sending 30,000 of probably the best-equipped men, especially the cavalry, to Greece to conquer Athens, was a terrifying prospect. Absolutely terrifying. Especially as they had direct knowledge of the country and the people from a Greek themselves. Naturally, upon learning of this huge invasion force, the Athenians decided we need help, and so they sent Pheidippides the Runner to Sparta. Now, to give you an impression of just how small Greece is, Sparta was only 150 miles away, which sounds like a lot to us, but we don't walk very far, or run very far. It only took Pheidippides two days to cover this distance, which is really impressive in my opinion, because I'm lazy. And he went to the Spartans, and he explained the situation to them, but they were in the middle of religious festivals. They couldn't send any men until after the full moon, I think. This is actually really common for the Spartans. They were incredibly religious, and would simply refuse to go on campaign if they, for some reason, had a religious excuse not to do so. And although they understood and were sympathetic to the plight of the Athenians, they had no love for the Persians. They sent Pheidippides back with the answer of no we're not coming to help, or at least not coming yet. So the Athenians and 2,000 men from their client state of Plataea elected to engage the Persians. The Athenians took up a strong position on a raised location looking down over the plain of Marathon where the Persians had pulled up from the bay. 
and they could have stayed there and fought a very defensive battle. It would have been very difficult for the Persians to dislodge them. However, it probably would also have been inevitable. The Greeks had nothing in the way of ranged support, and they had no cavalry. So they ended up choosing Miltiades' plan of assaulting the Persians. This must have been a very hard sell, which is presumably why half of the generals voted against it, and it required Miltiades to persuade Callimachus theoretically very eloquently, although we can never be sure of the actual veracity of any ancient speeches, to join on his side. When it comes to the actual details of the battle, we can see that Miltiades is a radical. He is happy to just throw out the Athenian, the Greek playbook for hoplite warfare in favour of defeating the Persians in a method that frankly must have looked so risky to his fellow generals. For a start, we're told that this is the first time on record that a Greek army was given to advance at a run towards the enemy. But more than that, this was the first time a Greek army had ever really advanced on a Persian army. This was the first time to, as they say, dare look without flinching at Persian dress and the men who wore it. Because these are the men who had conquered the largest empire in human history. And yet the Athenians and Plataeans just threw convention to the wind and extremely bravely charged a force that outnumbered them three to one. Miltiades shows that he knew exactly what he was doing by the disposition of his troops before the battle. To thin out his line and make the Greek line as long as the Persian line is one thing, but to thin the centre excessively to have weight on the wings is a very interesting manoeuvre. He was clearly betting on the fact that the Greek centre would be able to obviously not advance and defeat the Persians, but hopefully to hold their ground for long enough for the wings to crush the Persians on either side. And obviously they had orders to turn inwards and attack the centre. And this is almost exactly what happened. The only hiccup in Miltiades' plan was the fact that the Athenian centre broke and retreated at least some distance, but then rallied again after presumably witnessing the two Athenian wings triumphant and turning on the centre to finish them off. If either of the Persian wings had managed to hold up to either of the attacks on the sides, this wouldn't have been possible, and it's entirely likely that the Athenian centre would have continued routing, and whichever wing had at least remained on the field would simply be surrounded and wiped out. Athens would have been dealt a crushing defeat, whereas really when the Persians are defeated it's not really a big problem. I mean, they lost 6,400 men, which is a lot of men, but compared to the millions of men in the Persian Empire, it's nothing. And it's important to remember exactly who is invested in what here. For the Athenians, this is an earth-shaking conflict. They literally say, we have never been in so much peril. For the Persians, this is a mere border skirmish. They're not really that bothered. They just want the obstreperous Greeks off the, uh, off the coast of their empire to simply just shut up and get lost. They want them to stop causing trouble in one of the most far extremities of the Persian Empire. And their intelligence tells them that, yeah, sure, 30,000 men should be able to do this just fine. There shouldn't be a problem. Why would there be? At this point, the Greeks weren't really renowned for very much. I mean, they were successful traders and they had philosophers at this point already, but militarily they were not a famous world-conquering power. This can be seen most evidently in when Darius I first comes to Asia Minor, and he's treating with the Greek states there. And they, he has an emissary, he has a delegation from Sparta, and they say to him, paraphrasing, something along the lines of, don't you dare mess with the Greek states in Asia Minor, or you will have the Spartans to deal with. And Darius's only response is to lean over to his advisor and say, who are the Spartans? To the Greeks, this must have held a lot of weight, which is why the Spartans would have done it. But to the Persians, they didn't know or care about the Spartans. They weren't impressed by this at all. So the Athenians were victorious, and by a very large margin. It's not unusual for deaths in battle to be very low in an ancient battle. Almost everyone is armed and armoured with a shield, with helmet, with greaves, with a chest piece. It's very difficult to kill a man in armour. 
especially when he is standing in ranks with his comrades, defending himself vigorously. However, it's very easy to kill a man who has his back to you, who is running away and has no defence. This is why there is always a massively disproportionate number of casualties on the losing side. So, I mean, it looks very impressive that the Athenians only lost 192 men out of about 10,000, and it is. But it's also completely expected that the Persians would lose thousands of men if they were routed, which they were. The really impressive thing about this battle is that the Athenians fought it at all. But not only that, that they took the initiative, that they, ch they engaged them first. That's the impressive thing. So the majority of the Persian army was still intact and made it to the ships. The Athenians only captured seven of the ships. And they sailed off to go around to the port of Athens to invade Athens before the Athenian army could get back. Now, it's commonly believed that the run of Pheidippides was then dispatched back from the army to Athens, the 26 miles, to tell them that we have won, and where he promptly dies of exhaustion. That's actually not correct. What happened is the Athenian army marched the 26 miles back to Athens at a very high pace, which is quite impressive considering how much their armour would have weighed for a start, and the fatigue after the battle, to head off the Persians from arriving at Athens before they did. And upon arriving, they arrived just in time to see the Persians arriving as well. The Persians see the Athenian army arrive back and just turn around and sail away. The confusion on this point seems to stem from one of my favourite ancient authors, a man called Plutarch, who, in a sense, did craft histories, but really was a moralist, who was quoting from Heraclides of Pontus's lost work. It seems to have been an honest mistake, but it clearly didn't happen. But either way, this is where we have now the marathon run, from an event that never occurred. One of my favourite parts of these events isn't actually in the excerpt that I read, it's when the Spartans finally decide that yes, they can now send an army to assist the Athenians, which would have been far too late after the full moon. But they arrive at the plain of Marathon to tour it, to see about the Athenians' great victory, and they confirm absolutely there was a great victory here. There was the 192 graves buried for the Athenians, there were dead Persians strewn everywhere, and the Athenians had set up a victory monument to their victory and we are told that the Spartans were very impressed. It's also worth noting the fate of Miltiades, the brilliant commander who engineered the Battle of Marathon. This really emphasises the finicky nature of Athens and its democracy, and how even the most glorious of men that she produces can end up as exiles because of, frankly, a mistake that shouldn't really have been considered the cardinal sin that it was. The following year, Miltiades led an Athenian expedition of 70 ships against the Greek inhabited islands that were deemed to have supported the Persians. The expedition was not a success. His true motivations were to attack Pharos, feeling he had been slighted by them in the past. He fails to conquer Pharos. He suffers a grievous leg wound, becomes incapacitated, and then becomes humiliated by this at Athens, because, frankly, people expected him to be ever victorious. He ends up being charged with treason and sentenced to death, but he is instead given the option of paying a fine of 50 talents, which is a huge sum of money. He ends up getting sent to prison and dies of gangrene from his wound in prison. A particularly ignoble fall from grace for a man who probably won Athens her greatest victory.